Dear Excellency, dear Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Roland Rösch. I'm Deputy Director of IRENA's Innovation and Technology Center, and it is an honor for me to welcome you all to this UN Ocean Conference 2022 virtual side event, Offshore Renewables for a Blue Economy, <clears throat> that IRENA has co-organized together with the governments of Colombia, Costa Rica, and Denmark. We are all aware that ocean is our planet's largest biosphere and covers 70% of the Earth's surface. Our oceans generate 50% of the oxygen we need, absorbs 25% of all carbon dioxide emissions, and captures 90% of the additional heat generated from those emissions. Oceans are not just the lungs of the planet, but also it is the largest carbon sink, a vital buffer against the impacts of climate change. We congregate at this conference because scientific observations and data are rising alarms that our oceans are facing unprecedented threats as a result of human activities. Its health, and, its health and ability to sustain life will only get worse as the world population grows and human activities increase. The blue economy is in a state of crisis, and if no action is taken immediately, we are in the real danger of causing irreversible damage to this crucial eco and biosphere. The international community must come together to identify viable solution to address this challenge. A tangible solution that must be explored is harnessing energy from the oceans due to their abundant renewable energy potential capable of driving a blue economy. Energy harnessed from ocean through offshore renewables, such as offshore wind, wave, tidal, and floating PV can contribute to the decarbonization of the power sector and other end user applications relevant for a blue economy, like shipping, cooling, and water desalination. Offshore renewables are also not without challenges, necessity to develop clear roadmaps, long permitting processes, and low research and development funding are some critical areas that need to be addressed to catalyze the developments in this space. Given all this context, the main objectives of this side event are the following. First, to discuss the synergies between offshore renewables and an ocean-based global blue economy. Second, to share good practices on policy instruments and initiatives to support the scale of offshore renewables at country level. Third, to identify priority areas where international collaboration can accelerate deployment of offshore solutions. The agenda for today's side event will be split in two segments. The first segment will be focused on presentations on presentations by Colombia, Costa Rica, Denmark, and IRENA that will focus on the theme of good practices in developing offshore renewables. The second segment will be a panel discussion with representatives from the private sector to hear their views on how countries can be accelerate adoption of offshore renewables energy solutions. To our audience, thank you for attending the event. I would like to emphasize, emphasize that if you have any questions to our speakers, please avail of the question and answer chat box to pose your questions. We will take note them, uh, we will take note of them and shall try to have them answered during this session. Let us now proceed with the first segment of this event. It is now a pleasure for me to invite Her Excellency, Mr. Thomas Anker Christensen, Climate Ambassador of Denmark, to share 
a brief remark on Denmark's approach to developing offshore renewables. Your Excellency, Mr. Thomas Anker, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Roland, and I hope you can hear me. I am actually live from the UN Ocean Conference in Lisbon, and uh, at least for me, it's a first to be uh, at a conference where I'm in a virtual side event. But uh, I hope uh, the noise from the conference doesn't uh, have a negative impact on my on my speech and on you being able to hear what I have to say about offshore renewables for a global blue economy. So thank you, Roland, and thank you for everyone who is participating in this uh, in this side event. Um, let me just start with the basics. Uh, the IPCC, the International Panel on Climate Change, is clear on the urgency of reducing emissions. Unless governments around the world make significant changes in their energy policies, climate change is a mounting threat to human well-being and health of the planet. Meeting the 1.5 degree target requires a drastic reduction in fossil fuel use. It also requires substantial new investments in renewable energy, energy efficiency, and innovation. And the Russian invasion of Ukraine has only increased the need for uh, accelerated action and emphasized the key role of energy policy in our modern societies. Now, let me say a few words about the Danish story. Uh, in the endeavor of bringing energy transition to scale, offshore wind, along with other types of ocean-based energies, will be of critical importance. And we have several decades of experience with offshore wind, experiences we are keen to share with others. Already more than 30 years ago, we set up the first offshore wind park as a demonstration project. It was at shallow sea depths and, and essentially using onshore turbines, uh, 11 in total. Despite, it, despite its limited size, this project proved the concept of offshore wind as being both technically and commercially viable. It laid the foundations for the much larger offshore wind farms that exist today. This ability to harness and res wind resources more effectively offshore and avoid the land use constraints meant offshore projects gained an interest. So fast forward to the early 2000s when the first large demonstration projects were built, constituting highly significant steps on the way to developing the large offshore wind projects. In 2004, the world's first offshore wind tender was issued with developers to bid for the amount of financial support they would need from the state to develop the project. This new tender system proved to incentivize cost effectiveness from the developers and important lessons were learned about how to adequately design offshore wind auctions. In addition, with the increase in the size of offshore wind farms and a growing project pipeline, it became possible to obtain economies of scale and reduce the costs of offshore wind. Fast forward to today. Last week, the Danish parliament reached an energy agreement to build an additional four gigawatt of offshore wind by the end of 2030. And we are also expecting to push the boundaries by establishing the world's first energy island. This island will be pioneering projects, collecting the power produced by the surrounding offshore wind farms and distributing it to energy consumers, both in Denmark and abroad, that is green electricity for exports. We're also investing massively in green technologies of tomorrow. With the increasing offshore wind capacity, power to X, so this green hydrogen, will have a great potential to decarbonize both transport and industry. So what are the important learnings after all these years, more than 30 of offshore wind in Denmark? First of all, the importance of stable long-term policies cannot be overstated. We have a long tradition of broad political energy agreements with a long-term time horizon. Politicians across different parties in the Danish parliament have broadly recognized that the energy transition including offshore wind, is also a means to fulfill multiple political goals. We reach energy independence, uh, energy security from imported fuels, create local jobs, and limit climate change. This has contributed to promoting an environment of financial stability that has been key for the success of the transition. And let me just briefly sum up in five concrete learnings. Number one, it is imperial that regulatory frameworks are designed to de-risk projects in order to achieve the policy goals. Number two, 
long-term stable, inclusive and transparent energy planning is essential and should be supported by legislation and concrete reforms created in dialogue with the industry and public. Number three, the final offshore wind farms in a country or region will come at a higher price. The first offshore wind farms will come at a higher price. Pipeline creation will foster economies of scale and help drive down costs. Number four, smaller demonstration projects may provide invaluable regulatory and technical learnings and boost the investor confidence, proving the scalability of the technology. And finally, number five, appropriate allocation of risk and streamlining of permitting procedures, both reduce regulatory risk and potential delays. And let me end by just saying that we are also now working at a global level um, in the coming decade and beyond, offshore wind has to unleash its vast untapped potential. According to forecasts by the IA and IRENA, globally, 2000 gigawatt of installed offshore wind by 2050 is needed to keep 1.5 degree goal within reach and to achieve net zero by 2050. Yet in 2051, global installed offshore wind capacity only totaled 57 gigawatts. So clearly much more needs to be done to remove barriers and scale up investments. We need to reach almost 40 times the current installed capacity to be on a 1.5 degree trajectory. Denmark is collaborating bilaterally with several countries to support national and regional offshore wind deployment. We do see, however, a strong need for developing offshore wind ambition in many more countries. And we also see a strong need for all stakeholders to work together, governments, organizations, private sector, and financial institutions. That is why Denmark, IRENA, and the Global Wind Energy Council are establishing GOA, the Global Offshore Wind Alliance. GOA is a multi-stakeholder alliance aiming to drive total global offshore wind capacity to a minimum of 380 gigawatt in 2030 and 2000 gigawatt in 2050. The ambition is to create a global driving force through political mobilization and the creation of a global community of practice. We hope to welcome many of you in Goa, both countries, international organizations, and private actors. And as a first contribution to this target, the Danish prime minister uh, about a month ago brought together her colleagues from Germany, Netherlands, Belgium, and the president of the European Union. Uh, and they jointly set a target of 65 gigawatt offshore wind in the North Sea by 2030 and 150 gigawatt by 2050. So uh, we are trying to to walk the walk and talk the talk at the same time. Thank you very much, Roland. Thank you, friends, for uh, listening to me. And I wish you a very successful side event. Thank you very much, uh, Thomas, for these remarks and sharing the insights uh, from Denmark. It is really a pleasure to have Denmark here as co-organizer of this event, because uh, Denmark is really a pioneer uh, country with a lot of experience in offshore wind and has achieved a lot. And I think these insights, these five insights and learnings you shared with us are already very, uh, give a very strong guidance uh, in, to uh, the audience in this event. Thank you very much, Thomas. I have the pleasure now to invite her ex His Excellency, Mr. Ronnie Rodriguez Chavez, Vice Minister, Ministry of Environment and Energy from Costa Rica to chair brief remarks on Costa Rica's approach to developing offshore renewables. Your Excellency, the floor is yours. Thank you. It is a pleasure for Costa Rica to be here. Thank you so much uh, to Irina uh, for invite to talk about experience in developing offshore renewable in Costa Rica. In, in the past, if you know, uh, some of you know, our country has been pioneer in developing of clean energy, energy in general uh, for, more, for more than 70, 70 years, we have focused on natural resources within the, the territory. Uh, this is how we achieved during the last decade about 99 electricity uh, without using fossil fuels. Uh, nowadays, the country uses uh, clean sources such as uh, hydroelectric, geothermal energy, wind energy, biomass, and solar mainly. But on the other hand, 
is a reality that Costa Rica has an area of exclusive economic zone in the Pacific Ocean. It is uh, approximately 531,000 uh, square kilometer. It is approximately 10 times larger than continental territory in Costa Rica. Uh, Avulis, uh, which fully justify the future creation of nature, uh, national hydrographic entity because we are sharing the maritime border with Panama, Colombia, Equator, um, Nicaragua. Um, this condition justifies seeing the maritime space not only has a natural conservation area or economic activity, but also has an opportunity to develop enterprise to obtain energy. Uh, an activity uh, that has already begun to be studied to determine its energy potential. For example, we estimate that the technical potential of um, uh, is more than 14,000 megawatts and in terms of energy, it is about 60,000 gigawatt hour per year uh, with a factor plan greater than 44% is higher in compared with the rest of the area. Uh, nearly 200 megawatt where determined can be exploited with the system fixed to the seed bed near the coast in areas with depth is less than 50 meters. And 14,000 megawatt in floating generation system. It was me, uh, it must be analyzed technically, economically, and environmentally in the future and consider its eventual incorporation to the national energy system. It's a big opportunity for uh, to Costa Rica and why not the rest of the area, specifically Central America. Uh, it's important to recognize that since 2005 studies um, has, uh, have been carried out to deter de determine the fundamental parameter for the development of energy from the sea in Costa Rica. This investigation were promoted mainly by in the Caribbean Sea. By 2013, it uh, was carried out the, uh, on the termination of the potential marine energy uh, for electricity in Costa Rica. This study includes Um, yes, I think that we have some. Uh, Sorry, we have a, a technical, uh, a technical problem. Can you hear, Mr. Rowan? Can you hear? Yes, I can hear you. Okay. Mr. Mr. Rodriguez is Chavez is back, I think. Okay. okay. Sorry for the in inconvenience. Um, it, it, I was talking about the study in. This study included energy from waves and coastal marine uh, current. Uh, the gross theoretical potential estimated throughout um, economic, um, uh, exclusive economic zone was identified uh, as well the theoretical potential available, taking into account natural physical restriction, restriction and usage of the marine space. In, 2020, uh, in San Jose, Costa Rica, the Pan-American Marine uh, Energy Conference was held 
It's important because researchers, entrepreneur from the non-conventional energy sector, consultant, member of the government agencies, private organizations, and studied met in Costa Rica to learn about, anal analyze, and discuss the main global initiative and trends that uh, are being developed in the field in the marine, uh, marine energy. It was important because we integrate all specialistic, scientific, and uh, people who want to uh, work in this area. Uh, now, uh, nowadays, uh, with the purpose of the evaluated environment condition in North Pacific Costa Rica, as well as uh, recommending the necessary investment in marine coastal infrastructure that allowed the development of offshore wind in our country, the Central American Bank and Economic Integration, and the Republic of Korea are working in studies on studies uh, to identify the potential of offshore wind energy, the challenge, risks, and opportunities in the in this kind of the enterprise. Now we are working in how to install in, in the future uh, wind farm because it is necessary to explode, to analyze this kind of energy. In conclusion, looking again at marine resources for energy potential is mandatory for Costa Rica to, the, to adapt the future dem demand of energy. And we firmly believe and the evaluation represents an opportunity to contribute to necessary transformation that the, our planet requires to control greenhouse effects and how to economic and social develop for all the citizens because our people and our planet need it. Thank you all so much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Excellency uh, Mr. Rodriguez Chavez, for this very interesting insights and sharing remarks uh, from, from Costa Rica. It is a pleasure for Irina to have here Costa Rica as a co host for, for this event. Uh, Costa Rica has a lot to add on activities related to ocean energy and blue economy. I have the pleasure now to invite Mr. Julian Antonio Rojas, head of the Office of Regulatory and Business Affairs of Colombia's Ministry of Mines and Energy to share a brief remark on Colombia's approach to the developing offshore renewables. Mr. Rojas, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And um, good morning here from Colombia. Greetings from Bogota. Um, for, thank you for the invitation to share some thoughts and some activities we have developed in Colombia regarding this topic of offshore wind. That is something new for our country, but that is something we are uh, working very strongly to develop in the short and medium term. Next, please. So first of all, uh, we want to tell you what have been our public policy from the Ministry of Mines and Energy uh, in this energy transition topic. And as you can see in the slide, um, we have uh, developed all our regulation based on these three axes. Uh, we want to have uh, an energy sector that is going to be competitive and efficient, that is going to be reliable and accessible, and that the most important, it has to be sustainable. We have made some commitments uh, in the international uh, panorama. We want to reduce our uh, emissions uh, through a 51% through the 2030, and we want to be uh, a carbon neutral in the 2050. So based on this, we have developed many, uh, many, many regulations, and we have enacted a lot of documents regarding the incorporation of um, renewable uh, energies, uh, in uh, variable renewable energies, because you know our energy generation matrix 
is now clean. We uh, have like 70% of our generation matrix based on hydro resources. Uh, but however, we are um, a, we have a lot of risk with the climate phenomena, with El Nino Southern Oscillation. And due to this, we have uh, decided to uh, manage to incorporate these uh, variable renewable projects. Next, please. So here you have uh, the energy generation matrix in Colombia. As I mentioned before, uh, we have now uh, the 70% in, in hydro based and the rest, the 30% additional is based on gas and coal plants. And we are going to end in the next two to three years with a participation or a share of the wind and solar projects of about 12%, reducing the uh, share of the hydro sources, but uh, uh, keeping the uh, zero emissions or less emissions that are uh, specifically from our generation matrix. This has been accomplished by um, some incentives, tax incentives and fiscal incentives we have uh, promoted in our law. And with the program of uh, many auctions we have developed in, in Colombia, we have made now uh, three auctions. Uh, two of them uh, that um, permitted the incorporation of at least 2.5 gigawatts of solar and wind projects. So this is very important for the future of energy in Colombia. Next, please. And regarding the offshore wind um, source, we have to tell you that in Colombia, we have world-class sources uh, specifically in this northern part of our country, in the Caribbean region, uh, that you can see in the map. And we developed a roadmap with the uh, World Bank help and, uh, and UK consultancy of, uh, that, that was uh, provided by RCG. Um, and as you can see there, we have uh, a potential of nearly 50 gigawatts of installed capacity of offshore wind projects that is roughly three times our currently installed capacity um, of generation. And this uh, was divided into fixed bottom technology and floating technology. As you can uh, see, uh, it is more or less a uh, half and half these, these technologies. And this gives some uh, huge opportunities for uh, foreign investors to come to Colombia and develop these projects. Next, please. This roadmap uh, gave us some uh, goals. Uh, we are looking for having these offshore wind projects of about a gigawatt in 2030 and ending the 2050 uh, with nine gigawatts of these offshore wind projects installed in Colombia in our Caribbean coast. And this would be very important to um, our commitments, our environmental commitments, they will reduce about uh, 244 mi a million uh, of um, tons of CO2 equivalent. And um, in our matrix, this will, this will represent how more or less 20% of our install capacity. Next. These are going to be uh, a lot of opportunities, new opportunities to Colombia. And we take a very a good look for our jobs and our investments. We are planning to have like 50,000 full-time jobs and about $27 billion of estimated investment, plus the uh, additions that we are going to have in reliability, in sustainability, and in infrastructure. We have to develop, uh, uh, and we have also many challenges that are in the next slide, please. Uh, that we are going to see, and those are going to be related with the transmission um, system, uh, with the port infrastructure, but we are also going to have a reliability because we, uh, to the best of our knowledge, we have 
capacity factors in our Caribbean coast of more or less 60%, 65%. So we have to develop uh, all these challenges we have to address in the next five to 10 years, um, ensuring the finance conditions. Uh, we know this levelized cost of energy in Colombia is still higher than the ones we found in onshore projects, but um, we know this is an opportunity. Uh, we have to be self-sufficient in terms of energy regarding all those topics we have seen in the recent years in Europe, for example. Um, and all this uh, supply chain is going to bring development to many regions in Colombia uh, to leave employees, to leave um, increase in our economic uh, development. So uh, we think this is the good path we have to, to take. And well, we are now working uh, we have started our roadmap development. Next slide, please. Uh, and, and, and regarding this, this start of, of the roadmap, we have to tell you that now we have uh, put a draft to, into comments. It's a draft that begins by uh, awarding some temporary occupation permits to the uh, agents that are interested in investing in Colombia. Mm, this draft is going to be published in its final version, maybe in two or three weeks. We are uh, searching for the best agents and the properly ones to come to Colombia. We are going to evaluate their experience in the world. We are going to evaluate their experience in uh, development economies as Colombia is. And we are going to have a process with a pre-qualification stage and then a scoring uh, stage that will end up with the awarding of some seabed areas or uh, temporary permits for those agents to make measures, to develop uh, their projects and to find if they are suitable for continuing and for um, um, ask for a concession that is going to last at least for 30 years, that is going to uh, have these offshore wind projects being developed in Colombia. This is uh, the, the advances we want to tell you. Um, we are working very hard uh, on this topic. Uh, we have been advised by many important and, and interesting sites like the World Bank, the UK government, uh, the Denmark uh, government. So we think we have gone through a very interesting uh, work. So uh, this is the stage we are in, in offshore wind development. And well, that was we wanted to, to tell you. Uh, thanks for your attention and here to know your thoughts. No, sorry. There is directly a follow-up question. The question here in the chat is, is Columbia working with Maritime spatial planning? Maybe there's a possibility to quickly answer this question. Yes, we are, we are starting uh, with these Maritime spatial plans. Um, we are working together with our Maritime Authority that is called DIMAR. Uh, they have made some sort of Maritime spatial plannings, but we now are looking through uh, going into some detail in those maritime spatial plans. Uh, but we think the, this process is going to be in parallel with the draft and with the first CVET concessions that we are going to give. Uh, so it's something that is um, uh, being worked in parallel, uh, but we do are thinking uh, in making these maritime spatial plannings with the DMAR, our authority. Thank you very much, Mr. Rojas. Thank you for, for these remarks and sharing the insights from Colombia. I'm also quite impressed about the, the ambition and plans 
that Columbia has an offshore wind. We are very pleased to have you here also as co-organizer of, of this event. Um, I would like to remind if there are questions, we have a very good audience. We have more than 150 people connected to this session. And uh, let's say if there are any questions, please uh, uh, ask your question in the chat uh, to this uh, Zoom platform here. Um, now I would like to uh, the I would like to invite my colleague, and I have the pleasure now to invite uh, Mr. Francisco Borschel to deliver a short presentation on the status and outlook in offshore offshore renewables, innovation, and markets. Please, Francisco, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Roman. Um, welcome to my side of the floor, the people connected now to this webinar. Uh, from our side, we would like to start by explaining a little bit on what do we refer to as offshore renewables. And basically, we refer to offshore renewables as three main technology groups. The first one is offshore wind. This is a slide that will be shared with all of you after the, the webinar. Gives you a snapshot of where the industry or the market stands at the moment for offshore wind. At the moment, we have around 56 gigawatts of installed capacity in offshore wind technology. Uh, till 2020, this was a market really dominated by Europe. Most of the all the installed capacity of offshore wind was in Europe. But in only one year, in 2021, China uh, has added around 17 gigawatts of new capacity. And because of that, now it brings that the market is basically now divided 50-50 between Europe and Asia. Just in one year, China has increased that. Just to put this in context, 70 gigawatts of installed capacity in one year is basically, as we heard from Mr. Rojas, the total installed capacity, electricity capacity, to provide electricity for countries like Colombia. So that is the amount of new offshore wind capacity, again, installed in one year, in one country. Now, within these uh, technologies for offshore wind, one that is innovative is floating turbines. So most of the offshore wind turbines now are fixed bed, so basically are attached to the seabed. So now we are seeing that floating foundations are picking up because that will allow wind turbines to be installed further out of the shore and in deeper water. So with better wind resources and more space to be installed. And this is picking up and we have already around 30 megawatts of installed capacity. And actually the offshore wind farm that has reported the highest capacity factor for the most production of electricity uh, is an offshore wind farm, which is called high wind in Scotland. But despite these uh, encouraging developments, there is still a long way to go. To achieve this 1.5 Paris Agreement scenario for the decarbonization of our uh, global economy, we would need to have around 380 gigawatts of offshore wind in 2030 and up to 2,000 gigawatts by 2050. That would require that we install every year from now to 2050 70 gigawatts of offshore wind every year. And that would require investments in the order of 150 up to 200 US billion dollars per year. Again, to put that in context, 200 US dollars per year is basically the GDP of a country like Portugal. So this is like investing the whole economy, size of the economy of a country like Portugal in offshore wind turbines every year from now to 20. So clearly there is still much more to be done, but the good news is that these technologies are becoming much, much uh, more competitive every year. Now the levelized cost of electricity from these technologies uh, is already in the order of um, 10 cents of US dollar per kilowatt hour, and we expect that in the next five years it may be reduced to even five to six cents per kilowatt hour, uh, which is already very competitive in many markets. And we see that reaction from many countries, big plans. We heard from Ambassador Ankar in Europe, but also in Japan, India, 
China, Korea, and also the United States. Next slide, please. So first technology, offshore. Second offshore renewable technology, ocean energy. And here we cluster wave technology, tidal technology, ocean thermal energy conversion, and some integration. At the moment, combining all these technologies, we have around half a gigawatt of installed capacity, so clearly lagging behind offshore wind. But the good news is that there is increased momentum and there is already a pipeline of around three to five gigawatts of new installed capacity that we expect that will be materialized in the next three to five years. For a full decarbonization scenario, we need to install around 12 gigawatts of ocean energy technologies every year from now to 2050 with investments in the order of 30 to 45 uh, billion US dollars uh, per year. Again, we are seeing that these technologies are becoming also more competitive. Uh, now already in the order of uh, around 15 to 20 uh, cents of US dollar uh, per kilowatt hour. And we expect that in the next few years that could reach around 10 US, uh, dollars, uh, cents of US dollars per kilowatt hour. And this is very com competitive in some markets where there are limited options, like for example, remote islands where you don't have space for other technologies online and you have very high prices due to imported uh, diesel, for example, for diesel gensets, which is in the order between 40 to 60 uh, cents of US dollars per kilowatt hour. So there is already an interesting market for that. And we see that also uh, in reaction from countries to develop these technologies, such as Canada, Scotland, here in Europe, China, and Japan, but also many small islands. Next slide, please. And the third technology category is floating TV. At the moment, there are already around close to three gigawatts of floating TV installed globally, but most of that is on fresh water, basically uh, hydro reservoirs. But there are still, uh, there are already a few pilots being installed and installing floating TV on seawater, which is the case, for example, in the Netherlands, but also in Singapore and some trials in some uh, islands as well. Uh, we see that also this is a technology that is, for example, uh, looked after in countries like Ghana, but also very much interest in Asia. They have plenty of sunshine um, available to give you resources, but limitations of land, like it is the case, for example, of Singapore. Next slide, please. So offshore wind, ocean energy technologies, and floating TV. These are the three categories of floating offshore renewables. But today's conference is about our ocean blue economy, sustainable economy, SDG for two. And we see also the very important role of renewable, offshore renewables supporting that. We see how these technologies can be interlinked and drive, for example, applications for cooling, for shipping, for aquaculture, for desalination of water, and even energizing uh, offshore platforms of conventional fuels. Next slide, please. And this is not only in theory, but our analysis already identified more than 25 projects already connected. But in this case, for example, wave, tidal, and OTEC technologies with other activities such as water desalination, cooling in the form of seawater air conditioning, oil and gas, aquaculture, shipping, and also in a, a charging of uh, ship and vessels. So this is already happening now, and we see more and more activity and interest from uh, industry to connect these uh, projects with other economic activities around the world. Not only because it's beneficial, of course, for the environment and sustainability, but also because create additional revenue streams that can monetize and create new business models for this uh, offshore renewable. Next slide, please. The other benefit of many of these technologies is that they produce a, what we call base load or dispatchable uh, electricity. And we see how these technologies are now being hybridized with other renewable technologies. And we see also more than 20 projects already looking at this hybridization with ocean energy technologies connected with, for example, wind, solar photovoltaic, or home hydro storage. 
Next slide, please. But as mentioned also by Mr. Rosas, uh, Ambassador Ankar, and also the Delegate for Costa Rica, there are some challenges that need to be addressed. Permitting processes, we have, for example, from Colombia, they need to start the permitting. But nowadays, the permitting process in countries like Europe, other economies, for these type of projects may take between four to nine years. Of course, this is a very long period of time. But now there are big efforts to reduce that significantly, maybe two to one year. International collaboration, because the oceans are resources shared by everyone, and we need to coordinate and cooperate on uh, these uh, areas. Marine spatial planning, we have a question about that. Extremely important to avoid any competition, but more synergies between different economic activities for our oceans, including fishing, uh, ecosystems, uh, tourism, etc. Continue with the technology advancements and supply and having a low risk management of global supply chain, for example, in terms of uh, in inputs to and materials needed for the production of this technology. The infrastructure to connect uh, electricity production and transfer of electricity from offshore to onshore and clear procurement process for optioning and selling the electricity of kilowatt for this. And finally, very important also, our countries need to have the appropriate port infrastructure and the skilled workforce to be able to develop this industry. Next slide, please. To support that, IRENA has established the IRENA Collaborative Framework Ocean Energy Infrastructure Goals, which is a platform where countries and governments can discuss with their peers on good practices on how they are developing this framework for offshore renewables, learn from them, and try to replicate good practices. We already have more than 40 countries engaged in this collaborative framework. And if you are interested, please feel free to contact us to be engaged in this platform. Next slide, please. And also, as an ambassador, I mentioned before, another initiative with IDENA is involved in the support of the government of Denmark and the Global Energy Council with the Global Offshore Renewable Alliance, which is more an industry driven. A, a initiative which follows from uh, front runner countries in offshore wind to accelerate and further the deployment of this technology. We align with this goal, I mentioned before, of having around 70 gigawatts of new offshore wind capacity for every year from now to the mid of this century. Next slide, please. And with that, I would like to uh, conclude my uh, remarks and I will go back to Ron. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Francisco, for this very com comprehensive presentation. Of course, IRENA is already um, eight years active working on offshore renewables, offshore wind, uh, offshore wind with floating foundations, floating solar and all ocean energy technologies. And of course, in the past years, together with, with the strong partners, we have just to mention here GVEC and, and also Ocean Energy Europe. We have been able during many events to collect a lot of insights on enabling frameworks and we have the collaborative framework um, offshore renewables. All these uh, dialogue opportunities help to, to get a very comprehensive knowledge and how to better promote and support offshore renewables. I had a quick check of the Q&A chat box and there have not been directly questions being asked. Many people asked about the possibility to get the slides of the last presentation there we, we will try to find a way to, to provide so slides uh, to the ones that would like them. Um, so since there are no questions in the chat box, I think it is extremely important for the next session that is a, um, a panel discussion that we get some question also in the Q&A chat box, which would make the, the panel moderation and the panel discussion a lot more interactive. So interactive between uh, the panelists, the moderator and the audience. So we have now completed 
the first segment of the side event. I would like to thank our speakers here for a very focused exchange on views. Um, let me now move on to the second segment of this meeting, which is a panel discussion, as mentioned, with representatives from the private sector to share their thoughts on the offshore renewable development scene. Please allow me here to introduce uh, to the members uh, a very great panel. It's probably good if all the panelists also already switch on their camera. I would like first to introduce uh, Mrs. Rebecca Williams, who is the global head of offshore wind at the Global Wind Energy Council, GWAC. Then I, we have second here, Mrs. Lotta Piertima, Senior Policy Officer at Ocean Energy Europe. And third, we have Mrs. Nadia Febina, founder of Lumare Energy. Fourth, we have Mrs. Eliza Obermann, Executive Director at Marine Renewables Canada. And finally, we have Mr. Eduardo De La Rolle, Head of Electrification Cluster in the Research and Technology Innovation Department at ENI. So as mentioned, all the panelists are kind of partners, stakeholders of IRENA, of who we work a very long time together. Thank you all for being here part of this panel. Once again, to our attendees, if you have questions to our panel members, please avail of the Q&A chat box to pose your questions. We will take note of them and shall try to have them answered during the session. So that would be a clear enrichment of the session if you would uh, ask the, the live question here. I would go first with the first question to all the panelists. So what are good approaches to harness the synergies between offshore renewables and a global blue economy? Maybe we, we start in the order as I presented the panelists. Maybe we start here with Rebecca Williams to give an answer on what she thinks that what are a good approach to harness the synergies between offshore renewables and the global blue economy, as we already discussed in, in our earlier session. Over to you, Rebecca. Thank you so much, Roland. And uh, I should say I'm also coming live from the UN Oceans Conference in Lisbon. Well, sort of live. Um, I'm at my uh, hotel and there's a huge party going on next door. So sorry about any background noise that you might hear. Um, it's a time of celebration, obviously, in, in Portugal for the Oceans Conference. Um, thank you so much for, for having me here, and it's, it's great to be presenting here at, the, at this side event, which is co-organized by two of our great friends, Irina and the Government of Denmark. As uh, Ambassador Chris uh, Thomas, and, uh, Thomas Anker said before, uh, we're really pleased to be working with both Irina and the Government of Denmark on GOA, the Global Wind Alliance. Um, Global Offshore Wind Alliance, sorry, and um, this is a, a cross-party, cross-stakeholder alliance, which is to build ambition about offshore wind. So please do get in touch with us if you would like to hear more details about that alliance. So to answer the question directly, I think the great thing at the moment, Roland, is that we're seeing so much ambition from countries out there on offshore wind, and that's really fantastic. Certainly since COP26, which I think marked a bit of a turning point in how countries were, were seeing the offshore wind opportunity, we've just seen rising ambition from countries globally. And now as governments look to respond to the, the twin or maybe the, the kind of three-headed crises of uh, the energy security crisis, the climate crisis, and also the affordability crisis, well, we see more and more governments being very excited about the opportunity for offshore wind. But whilst there's lots of ambition now, I don't think yet we're yet seeing the requisite policy frameworks being implemented uh, across the world yet. So what I'd like to, to raise to you all today is the need for, for really kind of five key points when you're considering how you put in place the right policy framework to drive offshore wind. Uh, and as I mentioned, there's, there's five key things. So we see the need for stable policies, for pipeline visibility, 
for a good competitive environment, uh, for well-resourced institutions that can help you deal with issues like marine spatial planning, uh, and also um, uh, that effective marine spatial planning itself. And actually the, the key thing that I draw on here today and really want you to, to put again to, to the wider panel and to the audience here is the issue of permitting. Because I think we are seeing that ambition now, which is fantastic, but what we're not seeing is enough seabed being leased. We're not yet seeing countries uh, taking this forward in their marine spatial planning regimes. And we're not seeing that link yet between uh, offshore wind targets and permitting. So I'd encourage any countries who are, who are participating today to really think about their permitting requirements, think about how they could be accelerated. And industry stands here ready to work with you to deliver faster and more efficient permitting to, to deploy more offshore wind in line with your climate targets. So I'll, I'll leave it there and hand over to the other panelists now, Roland. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Rebecca. That's, uh, yeah, I, I think also with, with Irina and, and with many stakeholders and partners we, we have, we see also clearly this rising ambition, especially related to, to offshore wind. So uh, now asking the next panelist, uh, Lotta Piertima, Senior Policy Officer at Ocean Energy Europe. What is your what is your approach to harness the synergies between offshore renewables and the global blue economy? Over to you, Lotta. Thank you very much, Roland, and, and thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure to, to be here today. Um, so I am talking um, uh, representing Wave Tidal, also OSHEC and Solidic Radiant Technologies. And um, if we think about what kind of synergies exist between ocean energy and other blue economy sectors. First, um, as presented already, there's powering other sectors with ocean energy. So um, aquaculture or other uh, offshore platforms providing desalination. Second, uh, collocating different maritime uses, for example, wind um, and wave, although this is not necessarily something that uh, many developers are looking at at the moment. And the third um, is supply chain activity that ocean energy creates. So some maritime sectors such as ports and shipbuilding have been in decline in the recent years and installing ocean energy and other offshore renewables, of course, will help revitalize these sectors. And in fact, those sectors, um, infrastructure, um, port infrastructure, um, shipbuilding, need to grow in order to service the growing offshore renewable sector as well in the future as it grows. And so to better harness those syn synergies from our point of view, we'll really need to scale up the ocean energy sector. And that will happen at national level, um, having as mentioned many times here already today, um, long-term policy frameworks such as deployment um, targets at national level and financial mechanisms and then revenue support to bring those um, technologies to market. And I can talk about that more later, um, later in the panel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lotta. Yes, of course, ocean energy technology still needs some more support as offshore wind, but of course, yes, as you said, we, we see some, some very good uh, developments also in this area. I, I would wish to, to um, ask next then Nadia Febina, founder of Lumare Energy. Please, Nadia, uh, what, is your, what is your take on the good approaches to harness synergies between offshore renewables and the global blue economy? Okay, um, thank you, Roland. Um, just a little bit of introduction about Lumare is based in Indonesia, and it focuses on developing Indonesia's huge um, OTEC resources. So in answering this question, I would like to plead for OTEC, of course, but um, for all the technologies that we will discuss today, um, OTEC has USP, a uh, unique selling point in relation to uh, blue economy which to me define as um, responsible use of ocean resources to improve livelihoods. So um, 
All offshore renewables can contribute to the um, global blue economy by providing power, electricity, and job creation. And OTEC is also doing that, but on top of that, it has this unique um, product stream, which is this cold, very clean, and mineral-rich deep sea water. And we can build a blue economy around that. So we might have seen all these um, artist impressions of complete islands powered by OTEC platform or OTEC module in the middle. And then around it, there is seaweed cultivation, aquaculture, freshwater production, and uh, seawater air cooling. Right. So, um, and also there's another thing where in oil and gas, we uh, speak of stranded gas. If we find a gas field that's too far to be developed economically, and floating LNG has actually unlocked, unlocked some of those stranded gas resources. Now in OTEC, I would say that we can speak of stranded thermal energy where the right water temperature is available, the required ocean depth is available, but the distance to the electricity consumer is simply too far. Now this stranded uh, thermal energy can be converted locally on the um, offshore, plat uh, offshore OTEC platform into energy carriers such as hydrogen, ammonia, or methanol. So a bit like floating LNG. Um, and you can even picture of a network of offshore fuel station providing ammonia for the shipping industry. And that also helps the blue economy. So yeah, if we talk about approaches to um, ha harness the synergy between offshore renewable and blue economy, um, I, I OTEC can provide an integrated solution. Thank you, Roland. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nadia, for, for this insight. I think ocean thermal energy conversion is a, is a technology that offers this uh, sectoral integration and multiple uses of ocean energy technology with freshwater production and the many examples you mentioned. That was very interesting. So uh, next uh, panelist would be uh, Elisa Obermann, Executive Director at Marine Renewables Canada. How do you see, so Canada has been very successfully promoting in some provinces the ocean energy technologies. How do you see from the Marine Renewables Canada perspective, the synergies between offshore renewables and the global blue economy? Over to you, Elisa. Great, uh, thank you very much, Roland. And I just wanna say, I would love to have been at the UN Ocean Conference in person, but was really thrilled to be invited to this event because it makes me feel like I'm part of it in some way. So thank you very much for the invitation. Um, and to just jump into your question, I mean, I think, you know, we know that there's a lot of potential for marine renewable energy to power other um, ocean industries and help meet decarbonization goals. Uh, Lada talked about some of those kind of uses and, and how we could see them, but the need to also scale up marine renewables to, to prove the technology and help de-risk, you know, those kinds of collaborations and synergies. And I think, you know, the key thing, um, we know what the potential is, but what we don't see a lot of, at, at, you know, at the moment is uh, marine renewables really being part of net zero strategy, strategies overall. Um, and strategies, you know, that mainly point to how marine renewable energy can support other blue economy industries. So I think that's really, you know, very key. Um, another, you know, aspect that I think is, is key in seeing how marine renewables can support decarbonization of, of other blue economy industries is establishment of a target, targeted funding program so that focus on the application of marine renewables, um, again, for things like aquaculture, shipping, offshore oil and gas. We know that there are funds already that exist for, you know, that could support those, but I think targeted funding really helps to ensure that those projects are realized and focused on. Um, and then the last thing I think I, you know, I would point out is that Sometimes other industries are really aren't thinking about marine renewables um, when they're thinking about how, how are they going to decarbonize, you know, and how are they going to meet those goals. So the ability for governments to help with that as much as possible through facilitating and supporting partnerships and collaborations, I think would, would go a long way. I mean, it's, it's not always easy. And I know with a few examples I've seen between, you know, aquaculture and um, for example, wave energy, there's still a concern, you know, from some of those industries about where the technology is. Um, and so as much as government can play a role in helping to de-risk those partnerships, uh, I think it would go a long way in helping, you know, to ensure that marine renewables is viewed as one of the solutions to achieving decarbonization objectives. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, uh, Elisa. 
do you do you think that let's say the 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 funding support with the with the program uh, to to support financially the implementation of ocean energy technologies worked in 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 Canada in in some of the provinces where, where you have this these mechanisms yeah well I would say absolutely I mean so one of the things that we've seen in Canada is the combination of a feed-in tariff system combined with like a capital grant uh, and that has really worked to both you know de-risk aspects of the financial the financial side of it but attract the private sector investment that's required and before we saw it before those instruments were used it was really challenging okay thank you thank you very much that's a very good insight and then last but not least, I have Eduardo de la Rolle from our uh, private sector partner uh, at ENI. So, and uh, Eduardo heads, is the head of electrification cluster in research and technology, technological innovation in ENI. Um, what, what is your work, let's say, related to these approaches to harness the synergies between offshore renewables and the global blue economy, Eduardo. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, yeah, honestly, so first of all, our approach is try not to focus just one technologies. We try to have a very wide area from very mature technology, like for uh, uh, the wind, but also other promising uh, offshore or marine energy, like uh, wind, but also wave, uh, etc. Right. A little bit, Eduardo, you are a little bit interrupted. Maybe you can go closer to the mic, a little closer. Okay, I try to speak a bit louder. No, uh, much better, much better now. Okay, right. perfect. The idea is to have a very wide portfolio on technologies in order to have the right technology for the right place and the right resource so try to have wave energy wind energy wind and offshore floating pv but also other solution that can be combined eventually size for different conditions also working it for some resources not only in hot spot I mean the very productive sites, but also considering sea like Mediterranean area, small island or other area in which we can uh, uh, capture energies and produce synergies with the local stakeholders. On the other end, another activity we approach is to try to practice and put in the water technology and try to find this kind of possible synergies uh, towards the growth. We have some example of trying to decarbonize our asset is to the wave energy, but also converting our assets into new form of utilization of the special plan. So we try to transform uh, an old platforms in an aquaculture and an agriculture asset in promote the biodiversity on the area and at the same time producing energies for other businesses, bringing what? Bringing our strong experience and, and, and knowledge and relations and also supply chain in the offshore operations. So we can bring this big uh, uh, knowledge and infrastructures trying to accelerate the process of deployment of combining the design solutions that can really find a potential synergies between a, a, a blue grow and the renewable sector's expansion. Very, very good. Thanks a lot, Eduardo, for, for these insights from, from ENI. Uh, we have some questions here in the chat, and I would like to take advantage of this. And I think the, the one's best place to answer these questions um, would be, in principle, um, Nadia. Uh, and I also think um, it would be good if, if um, uh, Elisa would give an answer to this, maybe for, for these uh, two questions here. So one question is, 
um, whether ocean energy may help to address energy access in remote coastal island areas. So Canada is the biggest country with the longest shoreline and Nadia has some ex ex experience on islands. Can you give a, a brief answer to this, to, to this question? Whether ocean energy may help to address energy access in remote coastal and island areas. Did you want me to start Roland or? Yes, that's yet? fine. That's perfectly. Yes, please go ahead. Okay. Uh, so, I mean, in, in Canada, our experience is we have uh, about 290, a little bit over that, remote communities, a lot of them in coastal areas. Um, and so marine renewables is, is a resource we are looking very closely at because a lot of them are near marine renewable energy resources. A lot of those remote communities, and most of them, I should say, are reliant on diesel or some type of fossil fuel. So, you know, some of the early projects that we've seen so far in this area in Canada, we view as being, um, you know, much of the learnings and how the, the R&D and the technology is developed, in, and as well as building capacity amongst communities um, and, and, and people that are, you know, in, in that community um, to work on these projects is really important and something that can also be, I mean, I think a lot of the learnings can be exported or shared as best practices um, or information sharing amongst other countries or island communities. Nadia, you have some additions here? Uh, it's similar. It's similar also in Indonesia that we have um, 16,000 islands, 17,000 islands here in Indonesia. And um, um, it's all uh, mostly the remote islands are um, 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 uh, uh, reliance, uh, reliant on uh, diesel uh, power generation. And that's why the ocean energy can help uh, remote communities to because um, the the um, the ocean energy itself compared to the um, uh, diesel because of the high um, high transportation cost from uh, the city to the remote locations the ocean energy actually still still um, a competitive compared to the traditional solutions. Thank you, thank you very much for this uh, very interesting answer. There's another question here where I can imagine that Rebecca has to say something for it, so uh, many countries pursuing a green hydrogen economy. So would it be better to produce electricity offshore and use the electricity onshore to produce green hydrogen or better business or, or to create a business case to produce green hydrogen from offshore wind and then transport this uh, green hydrogen via pipelines? Mm. Yeah, great question usages of, of green hydrogen. Start by saying that an electrification first approach is probably the most efficient approach. Um, but then when we're getting onto other sectors, the role of green hydrogen becomes very clear. Um, I'm just gonna pause because I got a warning about my internet, but I think it's okay. The model could be used in either way. You could produce green hydrogen mm -hmm. offshore and it could, it could not connect to the grid at all. You could produce green hydrogen, green hydrogen and use a pipeline to bring it back, or you could produce green hydrogen and then directly use that tips or to be transported as a fuel um, without, without pipelines. So there are many different ways of, of using that technology. And we see, as I mentioned, a huge role for green hydrogen in, uh, in decarbonizing hard to abate sectors and in also enabling countries that have good wind resources, very wind resources that might not have high population. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much um, for these insights. I, there is a, is a question related to financial mechanisms to support technology in early stages of commercialization. I think that uh, LOTA from Ocean Energy Europe, because many of the ocean energy technologies are still in an earlier stage of the commercialization. So what would be the best mechanisms to provide that support minimizing the impact of taxpayers? So let's say, what are the best ways of helping this uh, ocean energy technologies to commercialize without creating a burden here for taxpayers? Yeah, absolutely. So I think here we need to think of the different stages of development and uh, like tailored uh, financial mechanisms for each stage. So if we think about um, research and development and um, and uh, 
prototype stage where projects don't yet generate revenue, these projects, of course, need public funding, often at 100 percent. So research and innovation um, funding in Europe, we have programs such as Horizon Europe uh, or the Clean Energy Transition Partnership. Those are really essential to um, enable those projects that then create learnings and, um, and improve the technology further. Now, when we move on to the demonstration stage here, um, projects start to generate revenue, but not enough. Um, it's too expensive still um, to be competitive. So here we need a blend, a mix of different financial mechanisms um, that help to cover the, the cost and um, and get the financial close. So uh, coupled with grant funding, but also um, loans and equity and insurance and guarantee funds and then coupled with revenue support to um to give that long-term visibility and also attract attract um, uh, private investors and then moving on to the pre-commercial and commercial stages here really we need still revenue support because uh, despite the fact that these projects uh, generate um uh, revenue it's still it's still higher um more expensive um, and we need a top up uh, for the electricity price but it's lower than in the demonstration stage and then you know when um when more pilot farms are put in water this support will uh, will decrease so that's kind of like the ecosystem of of the financial mechanisms that are needed thank you thank you very interesting Lotha. so it, it is very clear ocean energy technologies need financial support from from governments or others but the, there are ways to minimize the risk and to make best use of the funding i wonder let's say in the case of eduardo so eduardo is working for eni which is known as an, an oil and gas company and they uh, they are working in innovation around wave energy technologies how do you, from a from a very strong, financially strong private sector enterprise, see the possibility to to strengthen the commercialize commercialization of ocean energy technologies in 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 this sense? Eduardo, you you can say something. On yeah, this? Uh, yeah. Uh, as as Lotta says, uh, many of the technology, especially what concerns ocean energy. Are not mature like wind, especially photons. So uh, we are trying to use uh, funds available, but we think that also competencies and private sectors have play a role in the technology development. Otherwise, the only public funds could not uh, not enough to really uh, match uh, the use we have. So as a private company works in energy, we try to invest in R&D, deploying technology, testing technologies, but also bringing competencies, uh, activities uh, in order to try to accelerate as much as possible deployment uh, activities, industrialization also of technologies in order to arrive as soon as possible to a stable commercial phase in which the technology is able to pay itself and becomes commercial available and uh, at the end on the market. Thank you. Thank you very much. There is a question about floating PV in the chat. I'm not sure who feels uh, to be a specialist in, in floating PV. I can imagine that Eliza can say something to this. But also, if, if others want to contribute to this question, are you seeing interest in your countries to install floating PV on seawater or hybridize offshore uh, wind farms with, uh, with floating PV or, or ocean energy combination with floating PV? What is the link there? Maybe we, we start briefly with Eliza. I can imagine that also Lotta has to say something to this. 
Yeah, I, I don't know how much I can say about it other than we are starting to see some interest uh, in, in floating solar PV. I think the the question that, um, you know, developers and others that would be prospecting and looking at that as a, you know, as an opportunity is what the regulatory framework would be for development offshore. Um, and so what I would just say about that is recently in Canada, there have been some announcements about the development of um, an offshore renewable framework. So what I mean by that is in federal waters rather than provincial. Uh, and that would help to, I think, catalyze, you know, obviously offshore wind is, is a big focus there, um, but also, um, you know, floating solar, uh, potentially off, you know, further offshore wave energy, that kind of thing. And so once we see that in place, I think there'll be a lot more potential for some of these other technologies to also be, you know, have opportunity uh, in Canada as well. Okay, so the, the opportunities uh, are coming up in, in, in this regard to combine different technologies. Um, I would say there is a question for Rebecca. The, the European Union offshore renewable energy strategy adopted in November 2020 led to the European Commission's deployment targets of 100 megawatt by 2025 and then one gigawatt by 2030 for ocean energy. Progress has been slow and only 2% of the 100 megawatt deployment targets have been met. What is the most important step which can be taken to accelerate pro progress? So this question comes from Kapil Narula from UN Esqua. I think this is maybe not in relation to, to offshore wind specifically, um, because we have seen more recently, um, obviously the SBO de declaration from the EU Commission and from other states around offshore wind. So I think this is probably more around um, ocean energy uh, of the sort. So I'd probably a topic to, to Lotta actually. Yeah, Lotta, <laughs> exactly. Thank you. Happy to take that one. Um, yes, indeed. So, the offshore strategy targets, as mentioned in the question, um, uh, are really great, but the progress to get there has not been um, so swift up as we wanted to. And the key um, actions to really help to get to that, even the 2025 targets, would be to, to um, improve the access to the financing mechanisms that are already existing in, at European level. So I mentioned Horizon Europe already, but there are other programs um, such as InvestEU Innovation Fund um, that um, are, are there, but they don't actually at the moment um, fund ocean energy projects. So there are tweaks to, to be made in order to make those more accessible um, and to really deploy um, projects in Europe. And the second um, action would be really to coordinate amongst member states. So there are many member states that do have a lot of developers and interest in ocean energy, um, but it's difficult to know what's happening in other uh, member states. So kind of like a, a co coordination uh, from the European Commission would really help there. I think that is, uh, let's say, why, why Europe on ocean energy technologies is, is really well developed because they create this network in bringing many countries together. And, and even across the Atlantic, there are cooperations that are, are very helpful. And I think also in Canada, many, many developers there also can come from Europe. So that's, that's a, a very great cooperation. Uh, there is an, a follow-up question from for Lotta. Uh, we are based in Ireland and developing a hydrokinetic energy technology for tidal and river insights. Permitting is indeed a long process and different for each country. At Lotta, do you know of any plans for, for the EU-wide permitting guidelines to speed up the ro rollout? Yes, thank you. So the European Commission actually recently uh, published the Repower EU communication that includes some uh, provisions to, to reduce the permitting of renewable energy projects to maximum one year. Um, so that's still in the in the in the planning or um, will be then hopefully <laughs> adopted to uh, at member set level, but that's something that yeah has has been published recently. 
There is one question again, to, uh, also to Elisa from, um, let's say related to your title site in Scotianova in Canada has huge similarities with the site in Northern Taiwan. How would you advise to kickstart a similar project like you with the sustainable marine? Uh, so I would say, I mean, some of the first steps that were taken uh, in Nova Scotia at, for several different areas of the Bay of Fundy, uh, first was a strategic environmental assessment. So really, um, you know, an exercise to collect data, but the really key thing there was stakeholder uh, and community engagement and understanding, um, you know, what the views are, because without that social license piece, it's going to be very challenging, as we all know, to move any kind of project forward. Um, and you still run into opposition anyway, I think. And uh, the other would be, um, you know, really understanding the regulatory requirements and understanding where there might be barriers or bottlenecks going forward uh, and taking a proactive approach. I mean, I think all, um, you know, many jurisdictions are still running into those challenges, but the more you know, you know, very early on, I think it will help to frame, you know, how a project and development moves forward. So th those would be just my, you know, two quick pieces of advice. Thank you, thank you very much, Elisa. Unfortunately, we are coming to the end of this session if we keep the, the time, uh, but I think it is a, a good possibility uh, because we have this excellent panel here uh, to, to have a very last, very close statement, maybe each one 20 seconds. What are some of the key uh, private sector perspectives that need to be considered by governments in promoting offshore res uh, renewables, as well as protecting uh, the oceans. If each of you can give me a very, very short uh, answer on this, what, what can, because IRENA is a governmental organization and to support your activities in the private sector or you coming from private sector associations, what should we tell our governments? How can they help you to promote uh, your offshore renewables? I, I still see Elisa, maybe we start there and then we, we go one by one till we close this session. A st short statement on this, sure. 20 seconds. Sure, thank you, Roland. Um, so I'd say a very key thing is certainty and predictability. So consistent permitting and regulatory approaches are needed. That obviously has a huge impact on investor and private sector approaches um, and how they invest, but it also has a huge impact on how we protect our environment. So looking at things through like a climate change lens, I think is very important in all aspects, but particularly when we think about regulation. Thank you, that was very efficient. Nadia, you are a founder of Lumare Energy. What would you expect from the government to help you uh, with, your, with your ventures? What could, can Irina, what can the government do for you to strengthen your business? Okay, that would, uh, what, what will help us um, is clarity from government. For example, um, um, what is the realistic target for the deployment and how much install capacity is the government targeting by the end of this year? So this needs to be realistic. Also in which area do you want to deploy? It means like allocating blocks and concessions. And um, of course, uh, for because private sectors need to make money and otherwise we cannot exist. So um, government, um, what are you, what, what is it that your incentives that you can give us to the private sectors? So, um, and then um, can you really be clear how they work? So yeah, it all comes down to the clarity and incentives. Yeah, I think that's, that, that has been said many times, no, that's a clarent, clarity, transparency, transparency, uh -huh. and then long-term uh, objectives, governmental objectives is very yeah. important. Lotta, yeah. what, what, yeah. what is your take on this question? Yeah, I think I must echo what uh, was already said. So really stable policy frameworks, including national deployment targets, uh, those funding mechanisms and revenue support, they will help create uh, market visibility, um, deploy pilot farms, and then uh, pave the way to industrial rollout of ocean energy technologies. Thank you, Lotta. Rebecca, what is what is your take here? What what should governments do the, to support the, the offshore wind industry? The offshore wind industry will bring the investment, but we need governments to address permitting and we need them to get marine spatial planning right. 
Thank you. That was very efficient. Eduardo, last but not least, the male here in this very exciting um, panel. Uh, Eduardo, really, what, what, you, what, what would you see from... from to be a really answer? brief, uh, reduce uncertainties in any sectors. Uh, regulation, permitting, incentives. If you have a clear status, private sectors, their calculation, their investment. If it's not clear, so reduce well, uncertainties. I would like to, to thank uh, all our speakers for sharing their insights and how potential action areas were catalysis of offshore renewables and can be achieved thereby contributing to the protection and conservation of our collective blue economy. I would like to thank again this great panel with Rebecca Williams, Lotta Piritma, Nadia Febina, Elisa Obermann, and Eduardo De La Rolla. A great, great hand to you all for this very interesting uh, discussion. I think we had more than 150 people online all the time, which shows that this was a very interesting discussion. I also wish to express a special thanks to the government of Colombia, Costa Rica, and Denmark for the co-organizing of this event. And with this, I bring to close our side event. And thank you all for joining us today in this very interesting um, meeting organized by IRENA together with uh, Denmark, Colombia, and Costa Rica. Thank you all. I would like to close the meeting now. Thank you.